They were the heroes from the future. Teenagers protecting the universe from those that would sow the seeds of chaos. Each had unique powers and abilities. And though they often had their differences, they came together to save the day as the Legion of Superheroes. Now you can be a part of their adventures and learn the history of the future in the Legion Clubhouse. When the Legion are relegated to eight pages of backup stories, things are going to get really weird. And this week, I think we have a really weird, nigh-incoherent episode. <laughs> Let's see how it happens. Superboy number 188, Curse of the Blood Crystals. Published July 1972. Written by Carrie Bates with art by Dave Cockrum and Murphy Anderson. Synopsis. Who has replaced Superboy? And what do they want? Curse of the Blood Crystals. You know this is going to be weird when it starts out with Superboy burying Mordru alive and then picking up red crystals and throwing it into space and then a thousand years in the future. Have you ever heard the term burying in a wrestling context? Uh, I have not because I'm not a huge wrestling fan like you are, but please uh, share what you know about wrestling. A burial in wrestling terms is a powerful character, either face or heel, beating their opponents so badly that their credibility is completely destroyed. So this is not merely a literal burial, but a metaphorical kayfabe burial for Mordru, who goes from being the most powerful, the most terrifying force in the universe, to being a jobber who appears literally in one panel at the beginning of this you know, eight-page story to set off a Carrie Bates plot. And I, I Wait, don't know she's how gonna, I feel about that. Carrie Bates is going to uh, uh, grab Stephen King and smash his ankles until he writes the perfect Superman story? You're thinking of Kathy Bates. Oh, okay. Carrie and Stephen King has an entirely different thing. But yeah, <laughs> Carrie Bates wrote this story. Carrie Bates is a, is a comic book writer, Stephen. So flash forward a thousand years into the future where yep. we get a but ugly uh, science ship floating through space and oh, yeah. reap, the and reap Daggle Station. and reap Daggle and Jonah, the actual names of the two legionnaires who are duty at the science lab, chameleon boy and ultra boy grab these uh, crazy red crystals and bring them on to the ship. You know, like you do, like you do. And, and, and you just, just have them exposed. Space. You just have them exposed to the air you are currently breathing. They have not yep. seen, they have not seen the scary space movies yet where, you bring something on board, you have to keep it in a containment unit until it has become decontaminated. Well, Alien came out in 1979. This yeah. is 1972. Um, I want to say that War of the Worlds had been around, but that was more of a reverse thing. Rather than, you know, getting something terrible from space, space comes to Earth and gets something terrible from us. So... I'm I'm just surprised that there's no force field. There's no protective there's nothing. anything. There is nothing. They're not even wearing spacesuits. It's just like, hey, let's open up the airlock and grab this crystal and slap it into this uh, in into this uh, reader thing that uh, electrifies it. That's the next thing you want to do to something that's been dormant in space for a thousand years is provide it some kind of energy. <laughs> We don't even know what this is, but hey, we're going to mess with it and see what happens. And of course, it has a negative reaction on our good friend Chameleon Boy, because the next thing we know, we see Ultra Boy coming down to Earth, waving at everybody, going, hey, everybody, I came down here to have a conversation with yous. <laughs> and then I'm going to steal a time cube. Now, I kind of I kind of like I kind of like this idea, right? So Ultra Boy steals a time cube and suddenly everyone is like wait a minute why did ultra boy go back to the 1950s in smallville something must be up and then we find out that it really wasn't ultra boy but it was chameleon boy in disguise yep. now remember a little bit ago matthew i said the last thing you want to do is expose yourself to some crazy thing from outer space because it might start doing some weird things to you and might make you want to go and kill other people and if you've ever seen John Carpenter's The Thing, which is a remake of a 1950s movie called The Thing, that's where you get to watch the skies uh, kind of quote. Right. But in that, there are these guys on an uh, Antarctic um, station, and they find in the ice 
some kind of alien something or other. And they bring back the only survivor of the Norway colony with them. But it's not really a dog. It's, it's an alien. In, it's a shapeshifter. It's an alien in disguise. And that alien in disguise slowly starts infecting everyone else and killing them. And so what do we have here? We have Chameleon Boy, an alien, assuming someone else's form so he can travel back in time to kill somebody. Well, that movie did come out in 1951. It was also a Red Scare uh, movie, no. right? You, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who the person next door is going to be, uh, you know, a Russian. Mm -hmm. And yet Carrie Bates has no problem using the word comrade so much in this story. <laughs> I think that's just Carrie trying to do a jaunty, hello, fellow kids dialogue. I... I don't know. Well, if you're doing a know. red, if you're doing a red scare story, and you started throwing around the word comrade, I'm going to start scratching my head and going, "What? It's the future." I guess the future of the past, right? Because they do go back to 1950s to try to catch Chameleon Boy, both uh, Lightning Lad and Brainiac Five. Yep. Travel back to the past, and they're instantly confronted by Superboy, who says, "No, I got it all taken care of. Go away." Everything's fine. We figured it out. It's cool. I've got a remedy ray that's going to cure him of the evil uh, Mordru rays. And he's like, okay, bye. But it turns out, once again, it's a Shrek. No. Nope. It's He pulled the same trick twice on a 12th level intelligence, and nobody saw it coming. But better than that. You know what's, is, yes, you know what is better than that. Remember how we've been talking about these uh, life... Like Life masks like rubber mask. that everyone is wearing. <laughs> Chameleon Boy comes up, up with a 1950 solution that fools everyone. It's a lifelike lead shield. <laughs> okay, that so he puts uh, over Superboy to look like it's Chameleon Boy. I I read that and all I could do is shake my head. It's like you know how a cake, you know the the cake pans that you can yes. buy that have like characters like maybe you get a pink panther or a Mickey Mouse or a Yogi Bear or something. I'm showing my age because that's or the last time I ever chocolate ghost. Yeah, I, that's the last time I remember doing any kind of cake mold kind of things. But that's essentially what Chameleon Boy has done. He's got a Chameleon Boy lying flat on his back cake mold yep. made of lead that he has put over the top of Superman to hide him from. These two Legion members who come back from the future to find what's out, what's going on. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, if you look at that cake pan and you look at Superboy, it doesn't you have to think that it's, it's got to be bigger than him, which means that that's like a seven and a half foot tall chameleon boy. Yeah. You'd think someone would have noticed. Now, okay, so they do, right? So like... Lightning Lad is floating above. They're all, you know, shaking hands with Superman. They're all flying. And Lightning Lad is like, look down there. It's Chameleon Boy. And Superboy's like, look, you don't have to fly down there. You don't have to look up close. You don't have to investigate this at all. I've got it all taken care of. And so maybe from a distance, and because of the way Superboy, why would Superboy be evil? Maybe they don't realize that. It is just, yeah. it is the, this is one of the most bizarre stories that I have yeah. read in a long time. It really is. And I think that the, the biggest problem with it for me is not the fact that, you know, these weird things are happening or that Superboy uses the super suction of his super breath to inhale all the kryptonite and then spit it away like he's in fifth hour study hall and he really wants to mess with the kid in front of him. But that all of this happens, and at the end of it, it's like, okay, everything's fine. What I'm going to do is, and this is what we like to call uh, the MacGuffin by proxy, uh, because burying Mordru takes away Mordru's power, he buries Chameleon Boy under the influence of Mordru, which takes away Mordru's influence? Somehow? I guess that's how it works. I mean, this is, it, this is really, I mean, this is a really weird story, and I, I can't provide is. any other context for this issue except that it's weird it is mixing it is mixing you know ancient magics with shape-shifting with you know red scare mentality in the 70s with yep. really bad plot points and, and developments where you have literally ultra boy explaining what happened lightning lad and brainiac five going here let's use the time cube and go back in time and two pages later they're like 
literally, maybe even only a page later, when you figure out how everything is split apart, they literally meet Superman, shake his hand, and say, okay, goodbye. Bye. And we didn't everything even need is any really of that. suspicious, but it's probably good. The thing that I find interesting is, rather than use the time bubble, which travels mm-hmm. through time, mm-hmm. they use Ron's time cube, which... Right. Uh, smart listeners will remember appeared in adventure 249 probably 25 episodes ago which actually just sends things back in time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you just pop up in 1952 rather than being sent back actually if it's 10 years superboy takes place 10 years in quote unquote the past so superboy is in 1962 well they talk they talk specifically here about going back they talk here specically about going back to the 1950s that's weird. Yeah, yeah. All set, you'll arrive in Smallville all. during the 1950s. That is not how any of this works. So there's some other weird stuff. I know you've got some notes on this that you wanted to go over. I think we've gone over all my weird stuff in that just this doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't because Superman, Superboy, is poisoned by kryptonite yes. for several hours, yes. but still has access to enough power to dig a hole, actually to inhale kryptonite, spit it away, flip up into the air and dig a hole. That's well, that's because as soon as, as soon as kryptonite's away from him, he instantly regains his powers. No, that's not how kryptonite works at all. Although, um, I, I do like one thing about this story. Okay. I like the fact that a thoughtless act by Superboy in 1955 leads to his near doom a thousand years down the line. It's not explored. It's not really the focal point of the issue, but it is kind of neat. Mm-hmm. And you remember those uh, costumes? We've talked a lot about Saturn Girl's uh, pleather bikini. Yes. For all of one panel, uh, Phantom Girl appears wearing the hideous Fredericks of Hollywood ensemble from Adventure number 403. She's literally in the corner of one panel of one issue and is never seen wearing the costume again. Fun but times. it does technically appear in this issue. Fun times. Anything else? I, I just didn't uh, like this issue. I, I I thought it was really a waste of space. It really is not. I wouldn't say it's the worst of the back issues, but it's probably bottom five for me of the Legion's you know backup action slash Superboy era. And the thing that I really enjoy about this is that everything that I do like doesn't come back. The exploratory station in space is never ugly, seen again. But it's it's pretty cool. We never see it again. Um, the whole thing with uh, Ultra Boy and his oh look, I'm a totally Ultra Boy. That's kind of neat. But you know, we never uh, he gets a really cool haircut. Yeah, uh, Cockrum is good. Dave Cockrum draws really really well mm-hmm. in in this issue. There are some scheming faces. From Chameleon Boy, the likes of which we haven't seen since Swan left the Legion several years ago. Right. Um, what else? Oh, uh, there's uh, more Tarzan Superboy in the oh, lead story. Man, I don't know what all of a sudden DC is obsessed with Superboy as Tarzan. Because like for three issues or something, we get Superman as a Tarzan analog. And I know that that's kind of how they're kind of based on, I mean, if you were to look at the extended story of pulp, uh, of the pulp comics of Tarzan and how he kicks off the pulp age and how that leads to superheroes and uh, the strong men is essentially trying to be the Tarzan and superheroes are, you know, directly tied to the strong man of the circus shows and the adoption from another, you know, another world, all those kinds of things. I don't know what their sudden obsession with Tarzan is. Well, this issue, uh, the, the first story in 188 is a direct sequel to the story we uh, read or didn't read in 183 last episode. Uh, There's a six-month gap between them, but it's interesting that this story and that story are the sole appearances of Karkan, the ape Superboy, until 1994 at the height of Zero Hour, of all places, when Karkan shows up again as part of the hypertime stuff in an issue of the Connor Kent, the Metropolis Kid clone Superboy. Mm-hmm. So literally, this character appears twice here, where we didn't like him, last episode, where we didn't like him, and in an issue of Superboy that we'll probably get to in Legion Clubhouse episode 265. You can skip this one in the in the, in the the vast history of the Legion. You can just skip this one. Yeah, it's, it's this is definitely a snoozer. Yeah. 
If you enjoy the show, we would appreciate your support. You can find out more and become a Legion Clubhouse member at patreon.com slash major spoilers. We always love really good discussions here at the Legion Clubhouse, and this week we get a little feedback. Now, a couple of episodes ago, I had this really problematic split in my mind about why is Saturn Girl wearing sexy bikinis as a costume if she's supposed to be a teenager and me looking back at this from the from the future feels kind of skeevy about it. But we had our friend over at the Legion Omnicon tweet at us uh, shortly after that episode was released. He says, hey, the Legion had already had four leader elections by the time Imra got her new costume, meaning at least five years had passed since the Legion of Superheroes had formed. Now, he says the beer bombs, and I don't know who the beer bombs are. Uh, the beer bombs put her age at 14 at the founding, but even if she was 13, she'd be at least 18 by the point in this uh, Legion history where she gets her her new uh, bikini sexy costume. Mm-hmm. Tom and Mary beer bomb were uh, big time Legion fans mm-hmm. who became part of the creative team during the volume four, the five year ah, five okay. years later Legion. Okay. And they did um, a Legion companion or a Legion compendium for the Palladium uh, gaming system, I want to say. Oh, right, right. I know that system. And they put a lot of backstory that you could never, ever, ever get in their comics into that book, which part of the reason I own it is for that. But yeah, they actually went through and broke it down issue by issue how old the characters were and what quote unquote gear of legion it is so Mm -hmm. even though we're 14 years into the legion in the real world about four to five years has passed in the comics based on annual leadership elections if we assume that so yeah yeah i i can i can see that i guess but still uh there's still not that question of what happens when you're no longer a teenager i guess you're still a i guess you're still a legion member you just have to be a teenager when you join it again rules rules are meant yeah. to be broken and these guys are going to break them break all the rules going forward I, do, I don't remember how far down the line it is but not too much further down the line we actually do run into a story that tries to address what being a child is in the future world of 3072 yeah and it's particularly awkward and bad about it but when we get there we'll get there we'll talk about it all right but we always enjoy your feedback even if we get something completely wrong or you just have a different take on our view of a story or something like that feel free to tweet at us at major spoilers at mighty king cobra or uh, at legion clubhouse Uh, certainly do that i'm watching the at major spoilers and the legion clubhouse one Uh, that's probably the best place to tweet first so that i can Share that with everyone and we can have a a record of it for uh, reading later. Or you can drop us an email podcast at Majorspoilers.com and we can talk about this on future episodes. Superboy number 190, Murder the Leader. Published September 1972. Written by Carrie Bates with art by Dave Cochran and Murphy Anderson. Synopsis. The Rock targets the Legion's leadership elections with lethal intent. Speaking of sexy bikini costumes, Saturn Girl is back with sexy bikini costume. Yeah, and and Monil gets himself a little makeover kind of sort of in this issue. In what way? I'm too busy looking at pleather bikini. Well, yeah, that is distracting. Monel normally wears that red uh, puffy Nehru jacket with uh, a yellow belt, blue trunks, and red tights. Mm-hmm. In this issue, and I think maybe only in this issue, his cape uh, cape stays, which are normally yellow, have matching collar and uh, oh, arm cuffs uh-huh. of yellow throughout mm-hmm. this issue. So it actually is attractive, and it does give his costume a little more balance in that huge field of red, but... Yeah, I think this is the only place that we see it, which is kind of a bummer. So this is weird because something's going down. They're mm-hmm. getting ready to um, to be a new leader. I guess they're voting, right? Yeah, which is weird because like five issues ago, we we're like, oh, yeah, um, Ultra Boy's Legion tenure has lasted all I, of like two days. I think now someone's going to correct me here, which is fine. Uh-huh. But this feels more like not a democratically 
elected system where the president is in place for four years or however long that they want to put a president in. This feels more like parliament where suddenly the Legion members can all decide, you know what? We have no confidence. (laughs) We're going to call a snap election. Yeah, we have no confidence in our leader. Therefore, he's out. And now we're going to elect a new prime minister. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe Monel did something to lose favor for the rest of the superheroes, for the rest of the Legion. And they're just like, no, it's time for to elect a new leader. And so once again, it is Saturn Girl and Monel who are up for the election. Monel obviously is is winning in this, but suddenly before the election results can be tabulated, they are zapped away a million miles away to a crazy planet. And the thing that is waiting for them on that planet is Validus. Yep. And Validus is uh um handler, for lack of a better word. Yep. Uh Dwayne Therock Therock Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> Interestingly, though, this issue does establish for the first time a change in the Legion Constitution, allowing Saturn Girl to run again. Previously, they had always said that a leader could only be leader for one term mm-hmm. and then couldn't be leader again. Mm-hmm. And in this issue... Um, Interestingly, a very, very Caucasian, instead of her normally blue shadow lass, announces this on the first panel. And then, of course, Dwayne Therock Johnson comes in and Validus is like, oh, I'm Validus, I'm an egghead, blah. It's knowing Validus's future backstory. Yes. It just becomes really weird that it's Saturn Girl that has to, to fight him and try to control him and try to zap him and do all of these things. I don't know that it's weird. I think that this story is part of what the people, because as we talked about in the first half of this episode, the beer bombs uh, who took over the Legion volume four and were part of the creative team when, or uh, no, actually I believe that was a Paul Levitz thing. Forgive me. But when this was all put together, the Validus was lightning lad and Saturn girls child thing wasn't established. Could it be part of Legion lore? Mm-hmm. And I believe that this story and the fact that Validus was so receptive to his quote unquote mother's psionic powers was actually used as a possible hint towards that because he shoots mental lightning. Yes, he does. His and father has lightning powers. His mother has mental powers. Uh huh. It all makes sense. And, and Saturn girl steps in the way of mon saving him. And because it's Which, mental energy, it really is only affecting her. Can I just say for a second Ein Minuten bitte. Why would you, not being bulletproof, leap in front of your friend who is invulnerable? Number one, because we get that sexy pose the panel before. And number Mm. two, because she's a Legion member. And that's what you do. You are willing to step in front of the, the, the speeding bullet to save your friend. Even if he may be bulletproof. But maybe these, so the other thing is, maybe, maybe these telepathic energies are tinged with lead. Oh, lead-based paint in the brain. Yeah. That makes absolutely no sense at all, but I'll buy it. I I I will agree with your first point in that Saturn Girl is very, very sexy throughout this issue. And this is Dave Cockrum again, or is this someone else? Is this This Murphy Anderson doing the inks? Cockrum with Murphy Anderson inks, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yes. All right. So what happened? So what's going on with Monel? This is really weird because then uh, Thay Rock Johnson is like, "I will crush you," and we see like <laughs> Monel just like almost breaking under the pressure of of these flying bubbles that are that are hitting him. Yes, the flying bubbles are absorbing his super strength, and he has to use all of his super strength to keep them apart, uh, to try and push them apart. But that also is keeping him trapped. And then at the point where he, you know, of course, at this point, he also thinks that Saturn Girl is dead. Mm-hmm. But he starts to panic. He starts to break down, which is also why this story uh, is the origin of another uh, bit of Legion fan lore that becomes part of the canon somewhere down the line. But he starts to freak out. He starts to mentally crack under the pressure. And finally breaks free with just sheer strength. Mm -hmm. And then he comes up with, so tell us real quick, tell us about, real quick, tell us about this, uh, this future fan lore origin theory thing that you got going on here. Well, you remember a few issues ago when Monel was quote unquote dead. Yes. Dream Girl. Dream Girl had a theory that Monel died, Mm -hmm. but it was actually Eltro 
who died in his place. His descendant, Eltro Gand, mm -hmm. uh, put him on a planet to save him, was going to take his place, but realized that they put him on a planet with lead. Mon was going to die. Do you remember Eltro giving up his essence to save Monel? Yes. The theory goes, and was later canonically proven, that Eltro didn't just transfer his essence into Monel's body, but his mind. Mm. Eltro is actually in Monel's mind. And when faced with Monel's fear of being trapped after a thousand years of trauma in the Phantom Zone, it's Eltro that's starting to freak out here. It's Eltro who later has problems with space madness. It's Eltro who eventually breaks down rather than Largand. Because Lar, is dead. as we've seen, yeah, Lar, we've seen from the beginning of the Legion, is over his trauma in the Phantom Zone. But the more that Monel's mind contains both Largand and Eltrogand, the more unstable and the more difficult it is for Monel to function. Interesting. So we've got a man with two brains thing going on here. Exactly. Eltro didn't just save his his ancestor's life. He actually became part of his ancestor and made him weaker in so doing. Do we ever so get way a, to go, Eltro. Do we ever get a, a crazy comedy issue where... Um, Lily Tomlin and Steve Martin are both trying to work it out inside of, of Monel's body. And, and you know, the one of them character is like, put Eltro back in bowl. <laughs> do, we, in bowl do we ever get any of that in, in, in here? Or is it just revealed that, oh my God, you have two people living inside you. No. And in fact, as I recall, the reveal is very anticlimactic. Oh, that's The a reveal shame. ends up being something where it's like, oh yeah, we took care of that whole Eltro thing for you. And then we see, oh, wait, what was the Eltro thing? And they're like, yeah, this totally happened. But it's not a problem anymore. Mon El's back to full strength. Bye. Now, here's the I, I, I really enjoyed this this issue because not only is Mon El getting to use his strength, not only does he freak out a little bit about this, this idea of being trapped, but we also see that Mon El is super, super intelligent because when they are zapped to a mystery planet, Validus has one mission. And that mission is to kill the leader, the Legion's leader. Yep. And so he goes after Saturn girl kills her or yeah. Monel, sorry. Monel goes after Monel to try to kill him, kills uh, quote unquote, kills Saturn girl instead. But then Monel is like, wait a minute. What if instead of you two being part of the fatal five, what if you teamed up with us and yep. we were the muscle for you and then you could take out you could take out Mano's hands of fate. You could take out uh, Axeman. You could take out Annoying Woman, and then you would be the ruler of the world. And Thayrock Johnson is just stroking his beard and going, "Hmm, I like yeah. that idea." Because he he's got a tr robot transistor he, voice. He's a, he has a moon accent. He yes. comes from the moon. He talks with a moon accent. I I now proclaim myself the leader of the Legion. At which point. Uh, Validus's programming kicks in. He goes, I must kill leader of Legion and just takes out Thayrock Johnson just like that. It is horrifying, too, because um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Thayrock or Therok, however one pronounces it. Yeah, yeah I'm going to just Therok, call him from now on Thayrock Johnson. Yeah, Therok accidentally disintegrated half of his body. Because he's an idiot. And happened, happened to have a robot half that he could attach himself to. But the attack, the onslaught of Validus melts his prosthetic half which is just so, i mean we don't get a we don't get a close-up in this issue because that might be too creepy but we do get the gloopy kind of uh it is gross after effects from kind of a wide shot and it is kind of a little bit disturbing and i think had we gone in for the close-up had we seen Thayrock johnson's face melting halfway away i think that would be traumatizing to children that would be, I think that would be too much. I don't think that that would pass Comics Code in 72, even though the Comics Code is starting to die in 72. You, you know what uh, does pass the Comics Code in 1972? What's that? As many sexy Saturn girl poses as we can get. Not only do we have the, the sexy girl pose right before she jumps in front of the uh, telepathic beams, we get to see her behind crack as she does so. And then we get to see her sitting in many other... Uh, poses yeah. where her posterior and other uh, parts are on full display and talking about some weird feelings. I'm sure there were a lot of teenagers having some weird feelings after reading this issue. Well, 
I have long maintained that part of the allure of this Bronze Age Legion is the allure of the sexy, sexy characters. I mean, if you are totally into seeing young ladies in costumes full of portholes and skin showing, it's there for you. If you're looking for, you know, ultra boy in tights, it's there for you. If you're totally into bouncing boy and, you know, that's cool. We don't judge. It's there for you. So I think that... Part of the absolutely part of the modern fascination with Saturn Girl's pink bikini costume is the sexy, sexy, mm-hmm. because the character has evolved way beyond an 18 year old girl who would wear that. And yet she's keeping she keeps coming back to it, even as, you know, recently as the 2010s, which is fine. I don't have I really honestly now that uh, as we talked about in the mid segment there, now that we kind of know that at this point, they're all at least 18 or older. I'm totally okay right. if that's if that's the way they want to go. I'm still going to point it out as problematic when you're trying to sell something to teens, but I think also at this point we're starting to see a big shift, especially over at Marvel, where we are starting to see the college age reader reading Marvel right. comics, and this may be kind of a reaction uh, to some of that. I also think uh, you had mentioned the Bronze Age a moment ago. I, I also believe that uh, Legion Omnicron or Omnicon, Omnicom, which, Omnicom, had tweeted something about a few issues ago the Legion kind of introduced the Bronze Age. Yes, I believe that the uh, the discussion was where does the break between Silver Age and Bronze Age Legion actually take place? And I believe that the argument, and we we have touched on this, I know we have. Oh yeah, where they're the talking about the, yeah, the argument the, about... The editorial uh, switch. Yeah, yeah, the editorial switch. Go, go ahead and break From, that down. Mort Weisinger, who was Superman's editor in the Silver Age, retired at the beginning of the 70s and was replaced by Murray Boltinoff. Right. And so that transition of editorial from Weisinger to Boltinoff has changed the nature of the Legion. And I think the argument that that is the change from Silver to Bronze Age is a good one. You know, it's a it's an argument that can absolutely be made. I, anytime you're talking about a change in era, it's entirely going to be in the eye of the beholder. I believe that the Bronze Age of comics starts in 1970 with uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and the Hard Traveling Heroes arc. Yes. Some people say later, some people say earlier, but the Legion's era, I think that change to Boltonoff is a very strong argument for the breaking point. But that, I guess that's still up in the air then because we can't say definitively that this is when the Bronze Age begins is with the editorial change at DC Comics. Right. You can't. Because was I mean, Boltonoff, was Boltonoff overall editor or group editor or just Superboy or Superman just, related editor at this time or was he editor over the hard traveling heroes Murray Boltonoff was the editor of the Superman titles okay so he would um, be the, the group Legion, editor okay yeah the Legion was considered part of the Superman group right right until well actually I think pretty much throughout its original old school run uh, probably well into the 80s, people would be like, yeah, that's totally, you know, it's a it's a Superman title. Certainly at this point, when it's nothing but a backup in Superboy's book, and even if it takes over Superboy's <laughs> book in the first couple of issues, not mentioning <laughs> names. We'll, we'll get to that in the future. But for now, dear listener, when do you think the Bronze Age occurred? Did it change when we got new editors on the Superman titles? Did it happen with Hard Traveling Heroes? Heck, did it happen when the X-Men first appeared? You let us know. Get those arguments started now. It's going to be fun in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> For somebody. By the way, if you argue the X-Men, I will vehemently fight you because that's 1975, dude. Hey, you said the 70s. Uh, that's true. But still. Also, also, why does Validus have a creepy face on his face? Right? Validus has a nose in this issue. And, and eyes. it's just wrong. If, if you go up, he even has eyes. It's nose and eyes. It is freaky freak. That's what that is. It is Saturn Girl, you have born a freak. Well, and that's not the only costume oddity in this issue. As we saw, you know, last issue, we talked about Phantom Girl wearing her new costume. Mm -hmm. In this issue, Karate Kid, who for a minute had that white costume with the hand on it. Yeah, let's let's forget about that one, shall we? Let's shall. He already did because he's back in his uh, brown gi in this issue. So... It's very weird to see the alterations. And, of course, we talked briefly about pink uh, pink shadow lasts at the mm-hmm. beginning of this issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think the best part of this issue for me is the opening sequence with the uh, caption boxes having hands. 
like a like oh, old yeah, yeah. school issue of The Flash. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So maybe this is. I think that every caption box should have hands. That wraps it up for this installment of the Legion Clubhouse. Matthew, what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that no matter how sexy you are, it's not going to have any effect on your son. I think we also learned this week that logic games can bring the villain down. And most importantly, we've learned that if you have a really hideous costume that you have to wear out of obligation, just lean into one panel and it'll be fine. Thank you so much for joining us this week on the Legion Clubhouse. We enjoy your feedback and we enjoy talking with you and interacting with you. Follow us on Twitter at Major Spoilers and at Mighty King Cobra. Heck, send us an email, podcast at Majorspoilers.com. Let's get more people aware of what's going on in the Legion Clubhouse and with the Legion of Superheroes. And uh, share, 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 share this episode with, with friends who are also into the Legion. And let's grow this show even larger than it is already. So until next time, I'm Uncomfortable Tight Clothing Boy. And I'm on the pedestal. These words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. The Legion Clubhouse is a production of Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC, and is produced by Steven Schleicher. Your hosts were Matthew Peterson and Steven Schleicher. You can follow Matthew at Mighty King Cobra and Steven at Major Spoilers. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at Legion Clubhouse. If you have questions or comments, send them to podcast at Majorspoilers.com. I'm Jason Inman. Until next time, eat it, Grandpa. This podcast is copyright 2019 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.